Professor John Reid, I'm Professor of Clinical Psychology here at the University of East London in Stratford. Um, and I've recently returned from Melbourne, uh, moved over to London, and in the last few weeks of being in Melbourne I came across this quite, in some ways bizarre, but in some ways not so bizarre because it's happening to so many people around the world. But in some ways it was a rather, ex it was a rather extreme case of uh, a man being held for months on end in, a, in Upton House in, uh, in Melbourne, um, at times restrained to his bed for days on end, uh, the lengthiest time we understand was 60 days consecutively, um, and given endless electroshock therapy. Uh, the last, uh, by the time I left we were up past 60 and I think it's now past 80, um, which is pretty much unheard of. I mean a standard course of ECT is supposed to be, depending on what country you're in, either 8 if you're in Britain or 12 if you're in the US. Um, and it's accepted that, that at that point you stop and see whether it's worked or not. Um, but something very odd is going on um, in the minds of the psychiatrists at Upton House. Um, I think that despite the fact that clearly it isn't working, because if it was working they wouldn't need to keep doing it. Uh, so it's not working but they seem to feel this need to continue to do it. Yeah, and this flies in the face of two sets of research evidence, and this is the research I've paid a lot of attention to in the last few years and have published summaries of this research. The first important piece of research is that there is no evidence that ECT has any effect uh, compared better than placebo and beyond the end of treatment. There is a small number of people who, while they're, while they're receiving the electricity, um, do show some improvement in mood, which is a mixture of placebo and the sort of euphoric effect you get from a brain, minor brain damage, brain trauma, I should say. Um, but nobody, no, there's never been a study in the 80-year history of ECT that shows that it's any better than placebo after the treatment has ended. Um, and in any other discipline, any other part of medicine, it would have been stopped 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, Equally importantly, there's significant uh, evidence of long-standing brain damage as a result of this so-called treatment, which is unsurprising since it involves putting through the brain 150 volts of electricity through brain cells that are equipped to deal with tiny fractions of one volt. And it, you don't need to be a scientist to know that that is going to burn out the wiring, to put it bluntly. Uh, the brain damage takes the form of um, two types of memory loss, um, retroactive and, and, and anterograde, which essentially are loss of memories from the past and inability to retain new information. So people often find it difficult to go back to their jobs after having had ECT if their jobs rely on cognitive functioning. And moreover, the most specific predictor of the brain damage is the actual number of shocks given. When we try to present this information to the psychiatrists in Melbourne, they are literally not interested. They just do not see themselves as evidence-based. Um, they might say they are, but they clearly have no interest in, in the evidence. We try to present it to them. Um, they do not respond to it. They don't critique it and say, no, you're wrong, John. They just won't look at it. Um, which is a very strange way to proceed. It's a little, it puts them outside the realms of science, outside the realms of uh, a genuine medical discipline, and in the realm of somewhere between um, sorcery, if you won't if you go back far enough to the Middle Ages, or a cult, if you like. Um, there's aspects of psychiatry that do function as a cult when they're challenged, they, they, t they tend to resort to sort of cult like behavior. So they stop listening to anybody but themselves. Um, and uh, what I tried to do and failed, unsurprisingly in a way, was I wrote to every conceivable body in the state of Victoria uh, whose job it is to protect the rights of people who are going through a difficult time in their lives and have fallen into the psychiatric system in the state of Victoria. Um, so the Department of Health and Social Services um, would not respond to me at all and said I had to speak to the Office of the Chief Psychiatrist, which had predictable outcomes. Um, this is where you get genuine cult-like behaviour because they uh, simply referred me to their own guidelines, which they had written, 
which were the most bizarre guidelines. What, they have their own guidelines? The state of Victoria. From other guidelines. The state yeah. of Victoria. Each state, this is, that's not unusual. They're usually pretty similar, though. Mm -hmm. Each country has its uh, guidelines for the use of ECT. They're, they generally say things like 8 to 12 treatments. and uh, They tend to minimise the effects, the side effects. And, but this was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. First of all, it was, a, um, I think it was about 30, 40 pages without citing a single research study to support any of the opinions expressed in it. And secondly, and particularly bizarrely, they had said a course of ECT is 12 and then added something which had clearly been added in the last few weeks because it had just come out, a new edition of the guidelines, oh. and it said uh, ECT, a course of ECT is 12. However, a second course may start immediately following the first course, which was so blatantly an attempt to cover the unethical activities of their colleagues at Upton House. I put that to them in writing, so please confirm or deny this, because I'm making quite an extreme statement here. Before I go public with it, I'd like you to have a chance to say that's not the case. They didn't respond. Um, so clearly it is the case. Um, and these are the people who, on their website, uh, one of their four primary goals is protecting the rights of mental patients in the state of Victoria. Now, that's a lie, um, and it's a very unethical lie. That's sufficient, I think, for them to be struck off to engage in that sort of activity with no scientific basis at all. No guidelines in the world say that. Only in the state of Victoria do they say you can carry on giving ECT endlessly and forever. Um, and the consequence of it, if they carry on, he will die. Um, he's undoubtedly already got um, quite severe. How permanent it is, we don't know, because we can't tell that till they finish doing it and then we wait a year. Um, severe brain damage. Um, and it's just, it's just extraordinarily unethical. And these are the, this is the senior psychiatrist of the state of Victoria, which speaks volumes, I think. I don't know whether that speaks volumes about the state of Victoria or about the profession of psychiatry or both, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I can't imagine he'd be the only one who thinks like that. Um, no, I'm sure I'm sure most psychiatrists, well, let's be, let's be fair. On ECT, psychiatrists break down into about three groups. It's interesting. A third are quite comfortable with it and are quite enthusiastic. This is very roughly. Now, a third use it very rarely, and a third won't touch it with a barge pole, which is kind of interesting in its own right. You don't usually get that response to a treatment, do you, in medicine? It either works and people use it, or they don't. People have their preferences and so forth. Um, but no, it, what is common, what, what isn't unusual, I guess, is, is the response of psychiatry when challenged when provided with some evidence saying, hold on a minute, just have a little think about whether what you're doing is working and whether it's safe, because here's a whole bunch of evidence that suggests it isn't. And generally they really struggle with positioning themselves as, uh, uh, responding as most medics would, to say, yes, that, that's important, I'd better stop and look at that. They just dismiss it as something unreasonable to challenge them in any way. There's a set of power dynamics within psychiatry that's extremely disturbing, I think. But that, well, that has been my experience anyway. That mm. most psychiatrists, they keep talking about how effective ECT is, and if you put, as people do, put to them, but what about the side effect? Mm. What about the memory loss? Mm. They just dismiss that. Yes, the memory loss has been dismissed <coughs> for a long time. They only say it doesn't. It doesn't exist, or it exists, but it's part of the mental illness, oh, yeah. which is They've the ultimate blaming of the victim in my, in my mind. In the early days, they were more honest. When, psych when ECT was first invented in the 1940s, you could read in medical journals that the way ECT works is by causing brain damage. Oh, right. Which sounds a bit ridiculous, and it kind of okay. is. It is ridiculous. Their theory was that some people, it was almost like a trauma-based model of mental health. Their theory was some people have had such bad things happen to them, it's better if we can erase those memories. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's layers of paradox. Yeah, in, in that. They're not just erasing the memory, they're yeah. erasing what might be the identity and a lot more, I would of say, course. and their ability to function. Yes. In the way that they did before. Yes, know. and their ability to work through that trauma in a constructive mm. Mm. way. But it, it's, it is, I, I, I sort of, I should have laughed, but it is kind of odd that we're working, so many of us are working so hard to get them to accept a trauma model now, 
to understand the mental health problems oh, that yeah, cause yeah, biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. But back then, they kind of, 60 years ago, they understood that, but they thought the answer was to wipe out the, the memories. Anyway, it's a bit, a bit of an aside, I suppose. Um, but also, my impression is, when they call it effective, mm -hmm. most people that have ECT even that then say they feel better, mm -hmm. it is very short term. The improvement, yes. and then they yes. can lapse back into right. how they felt before, and sometimes even worse. Yeah. So but again, that to me suggests it's not effective mm. in that the effect of it doesn't last, but That's the right. side effects do last. That's right. It, for those, it is a small percentage that get any benefit from it at all. It does not last. Um, but you do get this sort of cycle where some people, because it did lift their mood temporarily, and then they go down again, mm. they will come back and ask for some mm. more. Mm. And then it's a little, which is understandable from their point of view, um, it's a little bit like charging up a, a car battery that's, that's run down. Mm. But people aren't like that, and people are depressed for reasons. Mm. And, and treating, that's a whole other, the broader issue here is that is the medicalization of social distress, of socially caused distress. But um, also from what I read about the case of Garth Daniels, is that as ever they just totally focus on symptom control mm. and so they're trying to obliterate mm. these symptoms mm. that they see not necessarily just of the schizophrenia mm. as he's been diagnosed mm. but because he's aggressive. Mm. So isn't that really also why they want to do ECT all these different times? Because I, they're trying to suppress him being aggressive. I don't. I don't honestly don't know why they're doing it. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I would, that's a reasonable guess that they think that there's if they give enough of it, he won't have the I don't know the energy or the capacity to get angry or get aggressive. Which is a fairly crude way to deal with aggression problems, isn't it? To sort of just electrocute people. But so it's many also times. they pro it's a problem they have with someone being aggressive. It's not the problems he has with mm. aggression. Maybe in a different context, yeah. if he wasn't tied to a bed and being forced all these different things, he wouldn't be so aggressive. He would be going out taking photographs, mm. say. Yes. I mean we all have to think about how we, we feel being tied up for 60 days consecutively and then be released. Would we go, oh, thank you very much? Mm -hmm. I doubt it. Um, but that's the problem with some psychiatrists are unable to see the social context of, of behaviour. Once they see, all, all they can see the symptoms of uh, an illness that they mm -hmm. think exists, like schizophrenia. That, that's a whole other story because there's no scientific basis to mm -hmm. the construct of schizophrenia. But that's, it's a sort of shared delusional system that psychiatrists have that there is such a thing that causes people to do things. But that's kind of another another issue. But anyway, I've carried on going to all these different organisations, including the Mental Health Tribunal, um, to present the research and to support the family. And that was an interesting experience, partly because the hospital's lawyer was pretty much directing the behaviour of the chairperson. The chair would look over at their lawyer and sort of wait a second and the lawyer would nod or and then he would, the chair would act accordingly, which was this is bizarre. Um, they paid no, no interest in the views of the family whatsoever. It was a complete rubber stamp. It was um, an absolute travesty of justice. And I then put in a formal complaint about that. Um, the chairperson of that particular meeting was the chair of the whole mental health tribunal, so when I put in my complaint, I said this must be investigated by somebody outside the organisation. Um, I was, how can you have a meaningful investigation? They gave it to the deputy chair to investigate, so he was investigating his boss. And the investigation took the form of his, he asked his boss, did you do that or not? And the boss said no, and that was the investigation. There were eight other possible witnesses in the room, none of whom were interviewed. That's the level that they operate at and, and that they think they can get away with and more frighteningly can get away with. And this is the legal system of the state of Victoria. The new Mental Health Act 2014 set up this system because people's rights were being trampled on so regularly. This was their response and this is what they've set up. It's an absolute joke. But also I heard that 
Garth himself, wasn't it? He tried to um, refuse it, and there was going to be a, a case brought out against them, or even that he was going to try and sue them. Or um, yes, I'm not up to speed with all the other all the other aspects. As but no, I'm things, wondering but... why there was a lawyer there anyway, because isn't hasn't it already become a legal case? It is a legal case. Why they why the hospital's lawyer was there? I suppose they have a right to bring there. Yeah, but, lawyer, but well, they feel they've got to something to defend. In, indeed, it was um, it was a very strange experience to be to be part of that. The person himself wasn't wasn't there because surprise, surprise, they had had another incident just hours before um, the hearing, so they had to strap him to his bed. So he was unable to attend his legal. He had a legal right to be represented to represent himself mm. there. They did pop down and speak to him while he was tied to his bed. Um, and amazingly, uh, they went down to speak to him to establish whether or not he had the capacity to refuse ECT. Um, and they decided he didn't have the capacity, well, they always they, which, which they always do, of course, mm -hmm. um, but said, oh, and by the way, he did, he has now agreed to take the medication that he was refusing to take. And I tried to point out, excuse me, did you see what you just did there? Um, he, when he agrees with you, he has the capacity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when he disagrees with you, he doesn't have the capacity. Can you see the... That's totally, that's totally irrelevant. You don't understand these things. Um, it was, um, but also, it was kind of pathetic, I guess, I, 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 but very serious. Because this, this group of people, but it isn't a group of people, it's all of us at that point in our lives when we could end up using psychiatry, have no rights whatsoever. In no other branch of medicine can you be forced mm -hmm. to take a treatment against your will. Mm. Um, if, if any other doctor tried to force you or me to take anything, uh, anti-cancer treatment or however much they thought it might save our life, if they tried to force us to do that, they would be struck off. In psychiatry, it's expected. It's a very, very strange sort of situation we have. Well, that's how they justify doing what they do, mm. and even medicating people yeah. on medication that can sometimes make people feel worse. Mm. They justify mm. it by saying, oh, well, if we didn't do that, maybe the person wouldn't survive. Yes. They, I, I do think the vast majority of them are well-meaning people, I don't. I, I, I do believe that the problem is that they are trained um, so badly in, in such an inappropriate model mm -hmm. to deal with human distress. Because human beings are quite complex, and the reasons we get distressed are quite complex. It's different for each of us. The answer is different for each of us, and they're trained in this one size fits all. Something's wrong with your brain idea. And once they start believing that, they can't really help very many people. Um, the, the medication can help a small number for a short period of time, but has such colossal side effects also that on balance um, it's very questionable whether it's worth taking worth taking. But it does seem it does uh, this help a small number of people. So they're not they're not bad people, they're just so badly trained. And I know a lot of other psychiatrists who find it very frustrating to try and operate within that system. Because if they step outside of diagnosing and medicating, their profession turns on them very quickly. This is, a, this is the other reason I call them sometimes a bit like a cult. Because they, I mean, they're fairly cross with people like myself, or, or people like yourself, I expect, or people outside of psychiatry who criticize. Mm. But they reserve their worst venom for their own. If you're a psychiatrist and you step out of line, they will destroy you. But there is now a critical psychiatry network, which yes. is made up of, psychi again, some yeah. academics, but yeah. also people who are psychiatrists. Yes. So it's there are some that indeed it's seem to be able to, or have set themselves up it's very to do that. It's very and they're, But now they're even making... Yes. That has it's, become it's who, changing. who they are. It's changing. Um, and um, it's a good idea on their part to do it together, as a, as a, to form themselves into a group, so they can't so easily be picked up. 
Um, but I have two or three very good friends who are psychiatrists who, who have dared to speak out and their, their careers have been pretty much finished mm -hmm. um, one way or another. So, um, but I think it is, it is changing in, in, in some regards. You do get some very brave psychiatrists who are willing to, to speak out about this. Um, we need more. And there's a good international movement, as, as you will know, of people, uh, people who have used mental health services, uh, psychologists, nurses, family members, who are, who are doing their best to fight back against this uh, abuse of human rights, which is always, we have to call it what it is, I think. But also, my impression is, the people that are here that are protesting against DCT are people who have had it mm. and yeah. are saying, but it doesn't work. Yeah. That's why they end up protesting. Of course. Because yeah. they've gone through it, actually, yeah. and they feel it's harmed them and yeah. it hasn't helped them. Yeah. So then it does, that's what motivates them to speak out. But yeah. again, why then are these psychiatrists not mm -hmm. listening mm -hmm. to the people who have had it? The, the, the pro part of the problem is that it's, if, if you train that way and you see mental illness everywhere, um, then you can dismiss people like that. Oh, well, they're a bit mad. They're, they're, you know, they're schizophrenics or whatever, so that you can't listen to them. They have, the, they have an extra layer of sort of protectiveness, um, so they don't... Uh, uh, rationale for their not listening, shall we call it. So again, it's a symptom of their illness, which is why they don't appreciate yeah, the well, treatment and why they yeah. think it... Well, there is a, a new symptom for schizophrenia, which you'll probably know about, called lack of insight. Oh. Um, so if you disagree yeah. with your well, psychiatrist... It's been around for a long been, time. Yes, but there's been an interesting, rather sad development. Um, it's almost funny if it wasn't so sad. So yes, this idea that if you disagree with your psychiatrist and say, no, I haven't got a mental illness doctor, this has happened to me, or I was raped, or this happened, and that's, that's why I'm upset. Uh, that's called lack of insight, as you know, and that's a symptom of schizophrenia. They have just recently discovered the part of the brain that causes this. Oh, well, there is a part of there's the, a part brain, of the that brain that causes it. That causes you to disagree with your psychiatrist. Oh, well, there's a part of isn't, oh, isn't, how isn't ridiculous. That, isn't that wonderful? Um, and they've come up with a name for it, anosognosia. Um, is it is, in the DSM yet? Um, I'm not sure. I have to check. It might, be, it might well be. Um, it's certainly in the medical and the psychiatric literature that this is. So any any time anybody uh, disagrees with their psychiatrist about whether they've got an illness or not, that is absolute proof that they do have that illness. So, but I mean, it would be laughable if it wasn't so sad and if it wasn't didn't have such a powerful, Im destructive impact on so many people's lives because. The first step towards being able to help another human being is the capacity to listen to them. You can you can respectfully disagree or say I've got a different take on that or different another way of thinking about it is this, but to sit there, not really listening, but just, mm -hmm. just sort of counting the symptoms yeah. yes. and then deciding what label to apply and then deciding what colour pill goes with that label, is not really designed to help people. No. Well, as I said, it is about symptom control, yes. even though most of these drugs don't necessarily take away the symptom mm. because it is just changing a neurochemical mm. sort of balance of in the brain. Mm. And if someone's had a trauma, mm. how is just the slight alteration in serotonin or mm. dopamine levels mm. going to suddenly erase the trauma? Yeah. Um, it is all about symptoms and medication rather than understanding why a patient feels as they do. Indeed. The part, another part of the problem is that we, as a society we've given psychiatry the job of, uh, there is a social control component to psychiatry yeah. and we uh, are not sure whether they've taken that on or whether we've given that to them, but that society has to figure out what do we do with people who might go hurt other people, or who have hurt other people, or who are saying that they're going to kill themselves. It, we can't, you know, hopefully, if I was to say to you, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm going to kill myself tonight, there needs to be some systems in place to sort of stop me doing that, I think, 
not everybody agrees with that. Some people have the don't have the right. They have the right to kill us. We certainly don't have the right to kill other people. Um, and somehow psychiatry, we've given psychiatry the right to do quite controlling things mm -hmm. to us if they think it's going to stop us killing people or killing ourselves. The problem is there's no evidence any of these medications stops either of those two things. Well, so some they of the antidepressants were, and drugs for ADHD that they're giving so many young people in America yeah, increase yeah. aggression from what yes. I gather. Yes, so the, the, prob the problem is we've given them this role of trying to stop us killing ourselves and killing other people, but they don't have the tools to do it. The, the medication doesn't stop people killing themselves, and uh, as you say, sometimes it increases the chances of killing ourselves. Uh, ECT, although they claim it saves lives, absolutely doesn't. Um, so the only tool they've got is locking us up when, we're, when we're, they're worried about that we'll do one of these terrible things. That doesn't help either. There's no evidence that hospitalising people um, lowers the, their chances of killing themselves or killing other people when they leave. So unless they're going to lock us up forever, that doesn't work either. And of course we know people do succeed in killing themselves on psych psychiatric wards anyway. So, so we've given them this, I'm not excusing their behaviour, I'm just trying to understand it. We've given them this role, uh, which I think is a legal role, and largely a police role, certainly in terms of homicide. Um, but we, they don't have the tools to do it. Um, but they have the right to, to lock us up. Um, I think if we can ever stop compulsory treatment, we'll be on our way to a, a, a functional mental health system. Well, I think that's what most... Again, I think most people in society don't realise mm. that for so many people end up in hospitals, mm. they are being coerced, yeah. And they're being forced, and they're being physically restrained. Mm. They've got medication forced upon. I don't think people realise what a coercive system it actually is. No, we don't. Most people don't like to think about all of that. It's pretty. It's upsetting stuff, isn't it? In well, it's people. upsetting only if you actually then care about the people that yeah. it's happening to. Most people yeah. might think. Nothing to do with me, I suppose. Yeah, but also most people know somebody mm -hmm. who knows somebody who's been in the mental health system. It's only once or twice removed. Um, but it's a whole set of issues that we'd rather just not think too much about, and they get continue to get away with it. And and I think the other reason why the rights are, are not protected better is because we do actually believe that some of these people might might come out and kill us. You know, the the image of the axe murdering, you know, yeah, but mad but person is quite a but powerful one still. It's been implanted for decades or centuries, isn't it? People actually believe that yeah, if you're but mad, it does you're seem going to kill people. That more murders are carried out by non psychiatric patients. So, yes. People that go around killing their wives, their children, mm. Mm. other people have not necessarily been diagnosed mm. as mentally ill and wouldn't be even yeah. um, and that is still a misconception that people who mm. might get diagnosed as mentally ill are the ones that are likely to harm Absol others. Absolutely, there is no good evidence that people with these diagnoses are more likely to, to harm anybody than the rest of us. Mm. E except at that point where they've been forcibly admitted to psychiatricals then some people do get quite combative at mm. that point. Yeah. I probably would, you probably would, mm -hmm. Well, you've got two options, you either get compatible or you get completely passive and go along with it, which is probably the better strategy, I don't, I don't know. But apart from those situations, they're, they're, there's no evidence that they're more, people with these diagnoses are more aggressive. There's lots of evidence that they're more likely to kill themselves, which is mm, unsurprisingly, yeah. because they're very unhappy and very distressed and depressed. Um, but also there's a lot of people, I'd say, that might end up in the system or are looking for some sort of help that aren't either of those two extremes. Of course, they're not the majority. The they're are going majority. to kill themselves and they're certainly not yes. one. So there's a lot in between majority, that, yes. again, have, whether it's anxiety problems, yeah. problems to do with emotional distress. Yeah. So a system shouldn't be, anyway, just 
sort of actually the concept of it to be treating the two extremes. It should be more sure. how do we help all these other ones? Yeah. And yet they treat them in the end as if they are on the That's extreme right. when they're yeah. not. That's right. The whole mental health system now is based around avoiding risk oh, yeah. and risk management. Yeah. And if so, if you're a manager of a mental health hospital or a mental health system, you, your primary outcome measure is how many people have killed themselves or killed anybody else. So that's how you're, you're sort of evaluated, really. That's, that's what we've reduced ourselves to. Um, and that's no way to design a system. But there was a woman who, when the Speak Out Against Psychiatry group first formed, she was one of the first members and she again she was being forcibly treated and she, she was so against that and her problem was that she wanted to be free of the system mm. to just be able to live her life mm. but in the end she ended up hanging herself mm. and i went to her tribunal and the psychiatrist there spoke as if they again and it was obvious to me, it was obvious to everyone who knew this woman that she, I mean, she was contacting her psychiatrist, that she didn't want to take all that medication. The psychiatrist would have been totally aware of how this woman felt, but at the inquiry, again, it's just she killed herself because she was that ill. Again, denying any part in yeah. what in that outcome. Yeah. And, oh, even, but then luckily for her, the inquest didn't put it down as a suicide. So, again, yeah. most people who know that would say that should have been on mm. that psychiatrist's mm. file mm. as mm. a suicide, but it mm. wouldn't have been. Mm. And they all got around it. So, and I think then most people that I've spoken to on that subject would say, well, there's a lot more suicides than ever get sort of recorded anyway. Indeed. And deaths from medication, and certainly deaths from ECT. Oh, yeah. You know about deaths from ECT. Well, I, I, I know what the research says about yeah. it, and there's a much higher rate of deaths from ECT than are in any guidelines of any, any country, if you look at the actual research. So it's because of the pressure, primarily because of the pressure on the heart. Right. And that's even when they're giving an anaesthetic. Yeah, and yes. Um, Can you say a bit more about Garth? About well, this, also uh, because, yeah, this idea of him having the capacity. Yeah. Because from what I gather, yeah. the father brought in another psychiatrist yeah. who has said True. he does have the yeah. capacity to say whether he yeah. wants ECT. So. Yeah. So the, the, this, this issue of capacity to consent is an interesting one. So in this particular case, the psychiatrists who want to keep giving him ECT for months on end say he doesn't have the capacity. Uh, they have no criteria for deciding that. They just go talk to him and then have a little think and they say, no, he doesn't. There's no um, checklist of, of things, you have know, to meet eight out of ten criteria or anything like that. It's just their personal opinion. It means nothing. Um, and we saw in that situation in the tribunal where he agreed to take the medication, that meant he had capacity. He refused to have ECT, therefore he didn't have capacity to decide whether he should accept a treatment or not. Utterly ridiculous. Furthermore, two independent psychiatrists, well, independent, uh, brought in by the family, second opinion type people, as you do when you have a, any sort of condition, you're entitled to second opinion. Two of them have said he's perfectly capable, he, he has the capacity to decide. Um, and that this, these particular psychiatrists at Upton House just continue to insist that he, that he doesn't. So who's right or who's wrong? You can't answer that question because it's a meaningless idea. The, the idea how, how would you decide whether I have the capacity to decide what's good for me or not? There's no way you can decide that. I mean, it just, you just have to assume that most people do have the capacity to decide what's, what's good for them. One of their arguments was particularly bizarre at the tribunal meeting. Um, one of the treating psychiatrists said, well, he doesn't have the capacity because he can't remember um, the meeting we had last week about this, and that's because of the ECT. So we want to be able to keep giving him ECT so that he does eventually have the capacity to decide whether he has ECT, and then we'll know he doesn't need it anymore. 
but then he won't have the memory to do I, that I anyway. I tried really hard to point. Can I just feed that? I said, stop a minute. Let me just feed that back to you and see if you can see how ridiculous that sounds. Just like, just just listen to the lack of logic in what you just said. And, I, and they couldn't. They couldn't, well, actually, at that point, the psychiatrist on the panel who was supposed to be independent came in and defended the psychiatrist who was there, which is. <laughs> they're there to protect the rights of the patient, but they realised that we had now cornered them in a way because they were talking absolute rubbish and she came in and, and defended them. It, it, but that was a bit of a stitch up. So the the whole idea of capacity consent is, is, is um, a bit of a, a non-starter scientifically or, or objectively and it's one they just use to get what they want. The other thing about the tribunal is that uh, the mental health tribunal in the state of Victoria, and I doubt it's that different from anywhere else. I looked at the figures for the previous uh, year. 87% um, of the time, the panel sided with the psychiatrist versus with the patient. So, and this is the body that is supposed to be protecting the rights of the patient. I'm not saying they should always agree with the patient. That, I mean, there are there might be times when it would make sense to side, but that's a pretty much a six or seven to one chance against you know, having your your voice listened to. And for one human being to say to another, I don't want you to put 150 volts of electricity through my head, thank you very much. Well, that should be sufficient. I think that should be the end of the story. Um, that we have empowered a group of so-called professionals to do that to other human beings um, is a very, very worrying state of affairs, I think. Well, and also my impression is ECT does not actually treat schizophrenia, which is what no he has helps. been diagnosed Absolutely. with. Absolutely it's no evidence. Only in cases of supposedly severe depression. So, Supposedly. again, how can they justify giving someone who's been diagnosed with schizophrenia all that amount of ECT and still claim that well, it's because they're trying to help him? That is what's unique about the, the professional psychiatry. They don't have to provide the evidence, the research evidence for what they do. Other branches of medicine are expected to do that. But in psychiatry, it doesn't seem to matter. They can do what they like, even when the research says, A, this doesn't work, and B, it's causing brain damage. They can do it anyway. It means they're power to themselves. I, th I think they are. Um, they don't seem to be bound by the law or ethics in the way that other um, branches of medicine are. In, in part of that, and this has developed over, this wasn't always the case, I have to say. I think this has developed rapidly over the last 20, 30 years as they uh, they've abandoned their ethics um, when they started allowing the pharmaceutical companies to pretty much run the profession. So you've got a situation where the leading journals, their scientific journals, are largely funded by the pharmaceutical industry and the advertisements there. And that you have articles in the scientific journals that are written by the drug companies yeah, and then they pay a psychiatrist to put their name to, on yeah, it. Yeah, it's called ghostwriting. Um, so psychiatry has got to find its way back to being scientific and ethical. It's strayed a long, long way out of um, what, it, what it used to be and should be. Which, which is a, a medical discipline with scientific, using evidence-based approach to medicine and using the codes of ethics that other um, medical people and psychologists and social workers subscribe to. They largely abandon, not all of them, but as a profession they have. I'm not talking about all individual psychiatrists. There's some wonderful people who, despite being psychiatrists almost, are actually managing to listen and helping them helping people so we shouldn't throw them all out with that, the same, tie them all with the same brush but the profession as a whole um, has strayed away from science and from ethics uh, and is doing an awful lot of damage as a result. And what do you think the outcome for Garth Daniels is going to be? I don't know what the outcome for this particular person will be. Uh, they, they just, uh, I cannot see a positive end to it. Um, one of the other psychiat one of the psychiatrists has come in has predicted that it will end in his death, um, and has put that on record to the treating psychiatrist, and that doesn't seem to even slow them down the slightest little bit. So when I mean, God forbid, but if he does die, I mean, people have been warning them. Mm -hmm. How are they going to live with themselves? I, I, I really 
I don't, I don't know. Um, I think, again, my impression is, if not to do with the CT, medic, some of the medication, people die as a mm. result of physical problems. Yeah. Psychiatrists seem to carry on living quite happily after that, uh, either in a state of denial or mm. there, this clinical detachment. They just, it, they, they're impervious to the reality of the suffering mm. in the world and that they are instrumental in that a lot of the time. Yes, so a lot of them don't seem to be able to see that.